The story is called I Bought a Witch's Prison. It was originally wrote by Jeff Mace and published on October 27th, 2020. Short background, in 2005, Vanessa Mitchell moved into her dream home, a former medieval jail, where England's witches waited to be hanged and burned. The paranormal phenomena forced her to flee. She became convinced it was possessed by evil spirits. This is the true story. St. Oisif is a cursed little village in the county of Essex, 83 miles east of London. At the edge of the North Sea, the town's 4,600 souls live in medieval cottages, arranged around a 12th century monastery, and in the cheap mobile homes of the British Royal Caravans. St. Osif, exact origins remain a mystery, and over the centuries, its townsfolk have survived floods, invasions, monsters, both imagined real and in fact every page of it is wrenched history is soused in the supernatural the village is named after the granddaughter of england's last pagan king according to legend ice was beheaded beheaded by danish vikings but managed to walk to the nunnery carrying his severed skull in her hands. In 1171, the village was burned down by a fire-breathing dragon. Then came the witches. During a satanic panic in 1582, 13 local women stood trial for witchcraft and two swung from the gallows. In the more peaceful area of 2005, 30 year old sales executive Vanessa Mitchell arrived at St. Ice to view a house for sale. Number 14 Colchester Road is a former medieval jail known as The Cage. It famously housed the 13 St. Ice witches, which included Ursula Kemp who was hanging, hanged for murder for neighbours with black magic. I remember seeing the plague outside. I remember seeing the plaque outside, Misha told me on Skype. I don't remember being scared of it. She had grown up in the village and used to walk past the mustard colour building on her way to school. My earliest memories are just being fascinated by the house. I remember being drawn to it, she said. Dark haired Michelle, who was single and free spirited, didn't want to live in a boring apartment like everybody else. The cage was different, it had stories to tell. During the 1800s, it had been rebuilt in brick and remained a jail until 1908, holding local scofflaws before their trial. In 1970s, a developer turned the cells into living room and added two bedrooms upstairs with invaluable views over the monastery grounds. It was just the kind of quirky home Michelle desired and a historic gem, she decided I've got to buy the house. Despite being one of over one of only seven medieval cages left in Britain, the St. Ice cage had languished on the market for several months. The owner jumped at Michelle's offer for £147,000. I could see myself living there and one day meeting someone and getting married, she recalled, just like everybody else, when they start new. Michelle returned to St. Ice after 12 years working 
in the Clitheroe timeshare business, selling vacation homes in Tenerife and Scotland. Working abroad had made her fiercely independent, but also insulated her from rumours and swore that were swirling about the cage. A middle-aged couple claimed that books flew off their shelves. Tenants broke their leases and fleed. Ambulances often, often idled outside, their blue lights illuminating the ancient pub next door. Inside the King's Head, drinkers gossiped about the previous owner who had recently hanged it himself. Michelle heard about the suicide but was not afraid of spirits. My dad never believed in ghosts. End of subject, Michelle said. She had grown up in another ancient house in St. Ice with abandoned servants' quarters and floors that groaned in the middle of the night. Hidden in the basement were her priest holes. She claimed for when the mo monastery was raided and the monks would need to escape, blood curling screams often rang out in the night. But there weren't evil spirits. Michelle's mother was a foster parent who cared for the addicted babies of heroin and crack users. I don't know about the history of witches, Michelle admitted. She did know that a skeleton believed to be Ursula Camp had been discovered in on sacred land nearby with iron stakes driven through its arms and legs to prevent the witch from rising and wreaking havoc on the villagers. She also knew that the alleyway behind the cage was called Coffin Alley because that was how dead bodies were carried from the jail to the burial sites. For many home buyers, termites or faulty wiring can be a deal breaker Yet Michelle seemed to mistake these morbid red flags for quirky historical details that added to the value of the home. I was completely unprepared for what was about to happen, she said. Less than four years into her residence, Michelle claimed her life was destroyed by paranormal activity that confined it. investigators, police officers and the church. She saw objects fly around the kitchen. She was punched, bitten and thrown to the floor. Mysteriously figures floated through her home and attacked her guests during Michelle's ownership. The cage became the most talked about active haunting in the country. According to John Fraser, the Society for Psychic Research, after an investigation, Fraser compared it to 112 Ocean Avenue in New York, a demonic family home in the Amityville Horror. Michelle couldn't wait to move in. One afternoon in mid-2005, she and her roommate, Nicole Curtley, 27 years old, carried boxes up the creaking wooden stairs. They had grown up together in St. Ice and were polar opposites. Michelle was iron-willed and outspoken, while Curtly described herself as blonde dits. Curtly was recovering from cancer treatment. Curtly was recovering from cancer treatment and worked casual shifts behind the bar in the King's Arms. She had heard all the rumours about the cage. There was only one family that lived there whilst I was working at Pope Curley told me, and the son kept setting fire to his bedroom. Somebody said it was because he was possessed. While Curley unpacked her belongings, Michelle plugged in an electric kettle to brew a 
celebratory cup of tea in a whole world kitchen. As the real estate agent's listing described, the house returned its old-fashioned charm, with the original wooden beams with crisscrossed walls. When she heard footsteps, Michelle turned as best to find Curtly. Instead, she saw an ominous black fog. Drifting through a door, Michelle was aghast. She had broken out in a cold sweat. When she peered out the window into Coffin Alley, she watched Curtly lift another box from the car and vowed to keep the incident secret from her sick friend and paying tenants. Michelle showed Curtly around the new home, downstairs a former prison room, an ominous wooden cage door were considered the original. In the fireplace, Michelle found an iron chain with a large hook that appeared to be a relic from the building's prison days. During a spring clean, Michelle sifted through decades of creepy old photographs and documentation left behind by tenants. I was able to get my hands on the house deed Records that go back many generations. She later wrote a memoir, Spirit of the Cage. I discovered that the house had changed hands on average every three and a half years since it was built. With the exception of only two cases. One example being a man who purchased the property for £150 and sold it only a matter of weeks later for just £100. The pattern revealed in the document would have deterred many buyers, but even if it had arrived earlier, Michelle had been struck by love, blindness, often experienced by her own home, home buyers. Michelle found another unsettling document among some papers in the kitchen. It was a death certificate of the guy that hung himself there six months before. She told me, I remember thinking, what a month to kill yourself. You know, her near Halloween. Next, Michelle lifted up an old rug and screamed. We had an infestation of thousands and thousands of maggots, she said. Nicole, scrubbed the floor with bleach while Michelle swept the lavas into the street. They discovered other issues with the house. It was freezing cold even on warm days. Strange drafts wafted the scent of baking bread, pipe smoke and the sour smell that turned Michelle's stomach. Then one morning, not long after, she moved in. She heard three loud knocks on the door. On the doorstep, Michelle found a startled boy with spiky hair wearing a school uniform. Not a ghost, but flesh and blood. Oh, really sorry, said Freddie Young, who was 12 years old. I didn't mean to upset you, but you know it's tradition for me. Young explained that his grandmother, who he called Nan, was a white witch. Nan used her powers for good, not evil, he explained. She'd warned him not to walk past the cage without knocking three times, as a sign of respect to the witches, to ward off evil. Michelle stood in shock as the boy turned and ran away down the coffin alley. Despite its strangeness, Michelle thought a little corner of St. Asterisk was magical. I couldn't have wished for a better place to be, she told me, though her bedroom window, she watched stags rutting in the monastery grounds. She drank in the king's arms with the locals until the street lights flickered off. At midnight, the village plunged into darkness and it felt like walking through the 1500s. All you could hear was crackling of fireplaces and smoke 
drifted into the Bible black sky. When Ursula Camp walked along these same streets 400 years earlier, St. Isaac was a broken town. With disenchanted monastery, it would have felt like the end of the earth, said Marion Gibson, professor of Renaissance and magical literatures at the University of Exeter. It was a society of people who were forced together, a kind of powder keg, a festering resentment. Kemp was likely middle-aged, illiterate, and poor yet respected as a cunning woman, a type of magical individual who, in exchange for coins or cheese, could cure colds or place the occasional curse. One day, in 1582, Grace and Thurlow, a neighbour, called on Kemp to help a sick child. Kemp recited his spell three times. A good child, how thou art loaded. The boy recovered. A bitter disagreement erupted over payment. When Thurlow's newborn fell from her cot and snapped her neck. She accused Kemp of causing the death by witchcraft. These accusations were rife in Essex, where the poor sometimes faked bewitchment to receive money given in pity. The cunning folk interfered in local disputes back then. Courts tried individuals for crimes associated with the witchcraft rather than for witchcraft itself, and nobody in Essex was above suspicion. Husbands accuse wives, children accuse their mothers, and Grace alt alerted her employer and local magistrate, Lord Bryan, Darcy, who arrested Camp and threw her into the cage. Darcy's father had been bewitched to death. Authorities believe and this inspired his crusade against what he called sorcerers, wizards and witches. By the summer of 2005, Vanessa Mitchell settled into the cage and discovered a tremendous sense of freedom. She had found new jobs selling caravans in a nearby vocation park. There, her charming smile and well honed sales pitch cast a spell over the older customers. I was earning six, seven grand a month in commission, she told me. With Curly helping pay a mortgage, Mitchell had never felt so wealthy. Curly stayed home while Mitchell went to work. On weekends, they howled along to Oasis Records and drank wine. It wasn't the setting. It wasn't the settling down that Mitchell had imagined, but it was bliss. Then strange things started to happen. Both women saw tiny bright lights floating through the house. Things would just disappear and turn up in bizarre places, Curtly told me. As you walked through the door, you had a feeling as if, like, you were trying to wade through jelly. Sometimes at night, a heavy latch on Curtly's bedroom door rattled as if somebody was trying to break in. Freddie Young became a frequent guest. Some days I knocked and we would chat about things he said. Young told Mitchell he lived with his grandparents in the old bakery. It had once burned down in a fire he said and then often saw the ghosts of the bakery and then often saw the ghost of the baker's three daughters. Grandad spent his days drinking in the king's head, which is how Young found out about the witches. He was sitting outside the pub when he saw the old woman in the cage's window. Man gave him a lecture about the afterlife. His grandmother wasn't a witch, 
with a freaky, dicky, pointy hat and a cauldron. Young explained that she always had some kind of lotion or potion on the go. Nana always steered clear of the cage when she flew through the village on her mobility scooter. At October, Mitchell and Kirby decided to throw a Halloween party at the cage. They both dressed up like stereotypical, if sexy, witches. Stripy tights, pointy hats and little short dresses. We call Kirby. Hours before the guests arrived, they were applying black lipstick. When they heard a huge crash downstairs. What are you doing? And she shouted down. Curly appeared from her bedroom. What are you taking me off for? I haven't done anything. The two witches looked at each other, but said nothing. But they were, they crept downstairs. They felt a presence in the house, but no one was there. The days following Halloween, the energy in the home completely changed. The TV volume was going from up and down. It was just ridiculous as Mitchell. Fridge maggots flew across the room. Curtly saw a soda can slide across the kitchen table on its own. The whole chain that Mitchell believed dated back to the jailhouse days had started to swim violently at night. The door in the hallway slammed shut with a bang. Then at night, Mitchell stared and started to hear disembodied voices from infants. Just like her mo mother's heroin babies. Soon after, Mitchell and Curtly marched over to the village church and asked to see the vicar. Both women were called meeting a Reverend Martin in Flower Dew, who Curtly described as a trendy vicar. The beloved Reverend wore a tidy beard with a controversial earring and was fascinated by the um, I was fascinated by the archaeology of St. Orsif. He agreed to visit the cage, which I said. The Reverend refused to comment on the story. The vicar walked in and he sat down in the front room and we had a really long chat. Mitchell McCall Curtly had gone out of the for that day. Mitchell gave the vicar two of the cage, was eerily silent. He started getting his robes and his holy water out and everything and said, is this common? I'm going to tell you this, Mitchell remembers the vicar saying, I've not been in a lot of parishes, but never since I've come to the parish in St. Joseph have I had so many people coming to me in private and coming to me in church saying I need you to come and bless the house. I've got a haunted house. I can tell you I've at least four houses up this road I've been into. I'm not going to tell you what houses they are because that's private. The vicar recited some prayers, Mitchell recalled. Then they took a second walk around the house, everything was quiet until they reached upstairs in the bathroom. Both the bathtub faucets were gushing water. I told you, Mitchell cried, I told you. She said the vicar agreed there was something not right about the house. He says I can feel it. If you have any more problems, call me. Of course, it didn't change anything. The house, which I said, she never called the vicar back. Despite the horrors of the home, things were looking up for Mitchell's love life. While she was selling cows around nearby Seawick, one day, a customer arrived from London with a friend named Jay. He was very handsome, very funny. I fell for him, Mitchell admitted. Soon, Joe was living in the cage. He didn't believe in ghosts or anything like that at all. She says, and I remember we were sitting in bed one evening watching TV, and he had a can of Coke. 
her side of the bed and it literally flew off and smashed to, to the wall on the other side of the room. During a whirlwind quote, Manson decided to get married in Las Vegas but Mitchell got cold feet. What if she was jumping into something that would become a nightmare like her current real estate investment? I cancelled it and flew back days before. He wasn't the right person, she said. I stayed in touch when Mitchell was sleeping alone again. I was sleepwalking, she recalled. Sometimes every night I ended up walking. I ended up waking up every night in the hall by the hanging place where the previous owner had hung himself, she said. It was like the house was gone before. She had her voices in her head that whispered to kill himself, kill himself, kill himself.